on with the program. Uh, again, my name is Megan Rivers. I'm from WBAL TV 11 News. I'm an anchor and reporter there. Relatively new to Baltimore, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, in case you guys haven't heard, you can also get free professional headshots done. Just follow that little arrow back there. Uh, you can get those headshots, pass along your email address, they'll send it to you. And everyone needs one of those, right? Okay, so we're gonna continue on as we proceed, I want to remind you that Money Moves Financial Summit is made possible by Bank of America. We are so thankful for all of our corporate sponsors here today. Uh, next coming to the stage is Joel Barnett, Fulton Bank's uh, Senior Vice President and Director of Commercial Affinity Banking, a program geared towards delivering exceptional banking services to minority women and veteran-owned businesses. Let's give Joel a warm welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a great advertisement. So, um, greetings from the Fulton Bank family. Um, my job today is to make an introdu introduction to someone very, very important. But if you'll allow me, earlier I heard some conversations about access to capital. And in Commercial Affinity Banking, of which I am the director, we are leveraging a provision in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to create a special purpose credit plan. And this will allow us to provide access to capital to historically disadvantaged groups. So I'm really proud of that. I'm confident that this program is gonna help businesses. By the way, I don't know if you know this or not, that minority businesses are the fastest growing businesses in the US. In fact, over the last 10 years, half the businesses created were that, were that of minorities. And that's something that we should all be very proud of and we should celebrate. But that said, there are some unique challenges. So at Fulton Bank, we're doing something about it. We're one of the community banks that someone was talking about earlier. We're doing something about it. So really, really excited. All right, here goes. So, I don't need to say my name. Could you move that up, please? It is an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you today. And I'm, and, uh, I'm here to introduce our next guest, who is an award-winning executive, entrepreneur, and brand builder, Dia Sims. She is the CEO of Labos 1707 Tequila and Mezcal, a new independent spirits brand with early backing by sports and cultural icon, LeBron James. It was launched in November 2020. And in May 2021, Dia also co-founded Prong Horn, hopefully my pronunciation is okay, <laughs> a 10-year initiative to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion in spirits industry to help participants within the black community achieve the goal of generating $2 billion in economic value in the U.S. She began her career working alongside Sean Diddy Combs at Combs Enterprises, where she grew within the company while building multiple brands and businesses under the company's umbrella. In 2017, Dia was named president of Combs Enterprises, very impressive, making her the first president in the company's 30-year history besides Sean Combs himself. As president, she oversaw multi-billion dollar brands, including Chirac, Ultra Premium Vodka, Blue Flame Agency, Aqua Hydrate, Bad Boy Entertainment, Sean John and Revolt TV, very impressive woman. Most notably, Dia led the transformation of the once unprofitable Chirac Ultra Premium Vodka to a $2 billion retail brand. Join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming State University alum, Morgan State, you gotta say Morgan it. State. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Morgan State. I'm so sorry. Yeah, go so Bears, hard. Morgan State. Set me straight, so Miss Dia. I'm so grateful. You're, you. you're amazing. Thank, thank you, thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, be beautiful black people that I see here on purpose to learn. Oh, we good? You guys hear me okay? Okay. So I'm about to introduce some incredible women to the stage, but I need, I truly need your full, undivided, Get, the, get your return on the investment for the time that you are here. These women have come from all over the country. These women have incredible knowledge. Get your notes app open. But I'd love to have your focus and undivided attention before I bring them up because they're about to drop some serious knowledge to change your life, okay? First, I wanna make sure, I know this panel is called 
women in business. Um, but I do want to share that if we got things right in the world and women were actually represented at the levels that they should be in business, it would have a $28 trillion impact on the world. We're talking about no homelessness. We're talking about getting rid of poverty. So, so men, women, this is for everybody. Because if we get women in business right, it means more money, more profits, uh, and solving more problems for all of us. I'm Dia Sims. I'm not going to belabor the beautiful introduction, but today I work as the CEO of Lobos 1707 Tequila and Mezcal. If you are over 21, please do stop at the bar, have a toast, celebrate having CIAA here in Baltimore, which I know, shout out to Zach McDaniels and Sanjay, that was no small feat, and it's something to celebrate. Uh, so please do check that out. As I, as I mentioned, I see my, some of my Morgan State people in the house. Um, so I'm thrilled to have uh, spent a lot of time in this great city going to, uh, to, Morgan, to Morgan State. Uh, and then I also want to take a moment to shout out Wells Fargo as one of our leading sponsors here tonight uh, and how they understand how important the black dollar is, uh, not just here in the state, but nationally. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it. First, our first panelist is Alima Redding. Alima has, come on up Alima. Alima has made a name for herself at Wells Fargo, and her contributions are the reason why we're in this sexy, beautiful space, having some, I saw some nice catering in the back, right? So we're grateful for your contributions. Alima serves as Vice President and Business Acquisition Manager for the Small Business Development Group. She's responsible for a team of business development officers and covers the entire mid-Atlantic region, right? So we know that I've already had some great people come up to me and ask, how do I get capital? How do I start my business? You know, this is a woman here who can give you the information, the resources, and the cohort cash to move it forward. Next, uh, I also want to share that Alima has had over 15 years of experience in small business ownership, regional leadership, and goes out of her way to prioritize black and brown women business owners. This is incredibly important that no matter really what side of the table you're on, that you use your resources to advance us all. Alima, I'm looking so forward to hearing from you and thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Next, we have Dr. Lois Peters. Come on up. So I'm gonna, I gotta stop for one second because I've never called her Dr. Lois Peters. We have been friends since high school, so about five years, and we went to Morgan State. <laughs> Uh, we, went to, we were roommates at Morgan State together, um, so it's extra special to, to share the stage with a good friend and tell the stories of our journey back when we were in college throwing parties at the roller skating rink, <laughs> and now uh, a prestigious and incredible doctor, a leader uh, in, uh, in medicine, an expert professional clinician who currently works as a senior medical scientist for Novo Nordisk U.S. Medical Affairs. Uh, Dr. Peters works with a full cardiometabolic portfolio on clinical research development and innovation. And throughout her career, she has been instrumental as a leader in education, research, and patient advocacy. Dr. Peters is a member of the American College of Cardiology, serves on the board of the American Diabetes Association, and has partnered with the National Healthcare Quality and Disparity Reporting System to benefit the underserved. So please join me in welcoming these two women. I have two more superstars coming up shortly. Next, we'd like to call Mariko Bennett, the founder and CEO of Coco B Productions, which is just fun to say, Coco B. Come on up. A premier consulting firm for corporate, government, and nonprofit sectors that provide tailored advisory services in strat, fundraising, event, and production management and advertising solutions. After two decades as a corporate political affairs leader in Washington, D.C., as well as for Fortune 500 companies, Mariko consults the globe's leading brands, including Amazon, Walgreens, Aflac, Raytheon, Global Blood Therapeutics, and Black Women's Health Imperative. She is dynamic and engaging entrepreneur, recognized for her exceeding client uh, expectations through a, through a focus on solutions, right? Like the good thing you'll see about all these women is, and I know this firsthand, Mariko, she's not talking about theory, she's talking about how we get it done. Um, let's give it up. We have another HBCU grad from Clark Atlanta. Mariko, we're so, we're so grateful to have you here today. 
And the final member of our panel is Samantha Abrams. Come on up. Samantha is the CEO and Managing Director for Walker's Legacy, a dynamic organization focused on serving multicultural entrepreneurs. With more than 20 years of experience as a corporate and nonprofit leader and a veteran business owner herself, Samantha is the consummate champion for entrepreneurs. Before her current role, she served as a Chief Strategy Officer at Halcyon and spent a long time in public affairs and marketing at Geico, uh, homebred right here in the state of Maryland. Thank you so much, Samantha, for joining today's conversation. It's, a, it's an incredible group. Um, I've known some of these women for many years, some for less, but you know, to a person, they are described not only as extraordinary leaders, um, but as good humans, right? And I think that is uh, incredibly important. Um, we're gonna start off with Samantha today. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> <Huh? Yep>. So <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is an incredible report that uh, surveyed 40,000 black women employees, 40,000 black, I mean, I know a lot of black women employees, I don't know 40,000, right? And, the, and two interesting stats stood out. It was that about three, uh, three times the amount of men, black women were mistaken for someone at a lower level. As has happened to me firsthand, I worked alongside yes. Puff Daddy, Brother Love, Diddy Combs, leading, so we were going to a meeting, and they would say, oh, ma'am, can you grab us, can you grab us some coffee? I said, I'm, I'm not a I don't mind getting coffee, but I'm the president. Like, <laughs> so, um, and that's happened to all of us. Uh, and it happens three times as often to black women. Today, mm. not 1905, today. Secondly, um, another startling stat is that it's twice as often for a black woman's judgment to be questioned. Mm. So we're in a meeting. You know, we did all the research. In the United States of America, black women are the most educated population. So our judgment comes with backup, right? So when we give our judgment, though, it is questioned twice as often as it is with men. Samantha, I want to hear about your experiences. What do you think that is happening? And then tell us practically how we can overcome when we're in a room and that happens. You know, there's just so much to unpack in that. Um, first of all, it, we have to think about our history. Um, and, you know, I recently watched The Woman King, and that, that film, there's just, I have to watch it again because there's just so much in there. And, you know, as a black woman, as a Caribbean woman, I'm from Guyana, big ups. There you go. Um, <laughs> I started in corporate America very, very, very young and was thrusted into some of the most important roles and oftentimes on stages like this speaking on behalf of the company. And I hid the truth about my age. I never wanted people knowing how old I really was. Let's just start with black don't crack. <laughs> Cause my grandmother Ruby had 14 kids and we all look great. Her descendants are great. Look at all this melanin in here. But seriously, culturally, there's just something that happens that we need to uproot it. And, and speak it out loud, in, especially in conversations like this, we're tired of having to prove ourselves over and over and over again. We're enough. Our credentials are stamped. We don't have to, to keep you know, telling anybody what it is that we stand for, what it is that we're capable of delivering. And it's, um, it's having more of us and champions in the room, having people who are anti-gatekeepers for us and really stand in an allyship and saying, no, like you do not have to question, this person is in authority, this person is the president or the CEO or the owner of this entity. Now, how we disrupt that, I think that's just a broader conversation. I don't singularly have a, a, an answer for that, but it's, again, I think it starts with culture, speaking life into it, calling it out, and letting people know right there and then, don't be coy and sit behind and let somebody do that to us. No, I am here, I'm here for a reason. What's in my knowledge bank is legit, and you're gonna hear about it. No, I love that. Yeah, you dropped some good jewels there in terms of, A, we make the room better. It's not a question, it's science, right? There's a million studies that show, like, and you said that, when you get in the room, the room is actually better. And two, do not be afraid to take up space, right? Make sure that your value is clear. You know, you can be elegantly impactful and course correct when you see it happening. And then also make sure we're being brave about standing up for the other women and the other black women in the room, and the other black women who aren't in the room. 
right? Now, Dr. Peters, in the healthcare industry, it's a little bit different, right? Because actually, uh, it's about 66% of the health industry is female today, but it's way disproportionately entry level. Dr. Peters, love to hear a little more about why you think that's happening. And then just as black Americans who are going into healthcare, what things can we be doing differently as we think about our career paths in that industry? So I think um, it's really important to know that less than 5% of African American physicians are taking care of our African American population. 3% of African American physicians are cardiologists. And it's the number one killer of African American women and African American men. So I think as a people, um, I strongly believe this, and my friends will tell you, I believe in going to an HBCU undergrad experience. It was a game changer, because what do you get beyond the classroom? Your mentorship, your lifelong friends and sisterhood that will support you through this journey is key and important. And as you compete in these rooms where it's 97% Caucasian males, you have to be confident. You have to know your worth. And at Morgan State University, one of the things I got one of my outside experiences at the National Institute of Health was global experience. So in my 20 years in healthcare, I knew that I had to get advocacy on a global platform. Because in the global platform, if you can be financially profitable, if you can save people time, they value that. And that will be a big advocacy. And when you play on a global platform, that will be a game changer. And also, don't let them, as African-American females, your time is valuable. Physician burnout and suicide is high. They try to push you into fields that are the lowest paying. Um, an average pediatrician makes $90,000. My friends will tell you, I don't know anything about kids. Don't assume because I'm a female that I want to be a pediatrician. That's not my lane, you know? So make sure you do your research. What is the quality of life? What, um, what value? Do you have a niche? Do you have a special purpose? Don't shy away from the high paying specialties. Not every African American woman wants to be an OBGYN or a pediatric um, uh, provider. For those that are, good for you, but don't let them push you into a box. I absolutely love that. I hope you guys are collecting these gems. Um, particularly, you know, we're in Baltimore, in the state of Maryland, where you have a disproportionate amount of, of participation in the healthcare industry. A lot of things that are happening here we could be proud of, um, but be thoughtful as you're thinking about your journey and selecting something that's both not just good for your pockets, but good for your life right, your whole life and making sure you're efficient with your time. I want to just once again ask, uh, there is a third floor bar, so I love it if you're having chats and exchange information. Don't hesitate to head upstairs and have a conversation, but if you're down here, I really want to give respect to these women and listen in carefully, so I really appreciate you guys just listening in re really, really closely. Um, so Mariko, let's talk about this. So people are quitting. People are, before uh, COVID uh, to the year after COVID, about 310,000 black women left the labor force. Like, no, I'm done. This is, no, this is whack. No, th no thank you. Pass. Right? And the, the yeah. Department of Labor and recruiters are like, what is happening? Now, at the same time, black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. I'd love to just hear your perspective on that dynamic. And I know you took the risk to walk away from a, a nine to five, if you will, and start your own company. That's a scary ass thing. Tell us, like, what was your process? How did you do that? And how can we do it? All right, well, good afternoon. I went to black church, so good afternoon. <laughs> OK, they with us, dear. Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you to my amazing panel. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, and I hope that, you know, our conversation brings value. And I know we're going to be after for a while. So if, you, if we didn't answer a question that you all may have, please stop us as you see us, because we came out to be here with you today. And we want to make sure that this is a positive experience and an impactful experience. Um, so yes, I did. I broke up with my nine to five, OK? I had to leave it. You know, I was like, you're going to keep treating me like this? I'm out. Deuces. Um, and so I represented. Uh, and worked for two global companies um, in terms of background and experience. So I represented one of the largest engineering companies in the world, and I represented one of the largest healthcare companies in the world. 
what I found was, so multi-billion dollar companies, I too was very young, uh, and they let this girl in the money room, and I was like, woo, this is what y'all doing in here? Okay. <laughs> um, and I stayed there. But what I also found is they love to take my genius, yes. right, but then not pay me fairly. Yes. Uh, and I would look around, and I'm the only, and I'm the only one in the room. And um, then not only did they let me in the money room, but I was in the compliance room, and I had to uh, submit certain reports on behalf of the entire organization to the federal government, which allowed me to see people's salaries. Um, and so I'm like, you know, so you want to take my genius? You want to pay me less than? Uh, and then not only did you want to take my genius, you wanted to present my genius like it was yours. Um, unacceptable. Uh, and so I did bank on me. And I was like, if you all are giving me this much power and influence and, 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 and allowing me to go speak on behalf of multi-billion dollar global companies, I was like, okay, I probably can go represent myself. Thank you. And pay myself what I am totally worth. So yeah, I broke up with my nine to five. <laughs> and I banked on me. I, I love that. And it seems like you are part of a trend that I'd love to see more of. Um, one quick, I do want to lay one stat, this is my favorite two-part stat, so bear with me, but uh, in the United States, the average white American is worth 13 times what the average black American is worth. When you double click on that and pull out just business, you can just actually own anything. You don't have to own Amazon, you can own a nail salon, you can own a couple stocks. That multiple drops to a 3x difference. So right now, with all the systemic inequities that we're facing, nothing, you're, the difference is already staggering when you just own anything. When you double click on two black Americans who own anything, they are likely to be worth 13 times what the average black American who owns nothing is. So when we see these examples of entrepreneurship, please underscore the importance of pay me in equity, right? The, uh, the importance of owning something. That could be you and your crew in, in your local bakery. That could be a little house you got to rent out in Naples, Florida. But think about your portfolio because the, the, the math doesn't lie, okay? Samantha, you are seeing every day all of these incredible black women-owned businesses. Can you talk to us about where you see these women winning and what worries you? Yeah, so there's so many, uh, Mar Mariko, your story is synonymous and I see a lot of heads shaking. What's, what happens in corporate is that we experience um, a continued uh, traumatic experience. As black people, we already come with a transfer of epigenetic transfer of stress. So toxicity exists already and then we go into the workplace and we have to deal with stress and trauma every single day. People are physically getting sick because of the trauma they experience. So what black women are especially doing, not today, not yesterday, not 10 years ago or 20, is saying, I'm going to bet on me. I'm gonna bet on me if I'm doing this and raising all this capital and doing all these fantastic things in corporate America, I'm gonna take those skills, I'm gonna take my connections, because let's admit, that part. the social capital is as equally important as the, the financial capital that we need to bootstrap these business. And oh, by the way, we're bootstrapping without straps. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it with very little infrastructure, resources, and support. We're taking money out of our 401ks. In my daily work at Walker's Legacy, where we're equipping and supporting black and brown women entrepreneurs, these women, like Mariko, like myself, like so many of us in this room, who've quit corporate, banked on our 401ks, our savings, our homes, started our businesses, they're doing just that. But we still see a significant um, underinvestment, mm -hmm. and we have to keep doing what I stated earlier, the proving over and over again. I recently had an experience where someone was looking to secure a lease they were told by the landlord, your financials are extremely strong. Your business model is great. Your product is great. But we decided to go with a multi-unit um, company. But this is after this, this business had spent months of due diligence. 
So you had that company spend time and money with their accountants, with their business people, planning, submitting, and then you drop that? Disrespectful. So what we did, we laid them out, we called them out, okay? And we let them know, you need to stop being an anti-gatekeeper. So black and brown women are just betting on themselves. They're saying, if I can do this, like, I'm just gonna go forth with boldness and get 100 no's, the 101 will be a yes. That's a, that's, a whole, that's a whole gospel right there. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges for, for black entrepreneurs, um, and, and particularly double down for black women entrepreneurs, access to capital. You can't get to that first million. There is no um, zip code, right, in America that has the lock on genius. It's represented everywhere. But get into capital? Oh. The, it's so disproportionate, right? So I, can you please talk practically about how we can get access to capital to launch these incredible businesses that are flourishing in our neighborhoods? Yeah, I, I love that comment, and it's true. What Samantha is saying about how we're cashing out 401ks, we're borrowing money from our house, we're maxing out our credit cards to fulfill an idea, a dream, execute on a business. Um, the number one situation that we face is how do we get access to capital? How do we leverage other people's money? Um, there's a number of ways that Wells Fargo is partnering with organizations such as CDFIs. I sit on a CDFI, I'm from Philadelphia area, um, on the board. And we're sitting there figuring out how to funnel money into the community, how to um, work with the small businesses to leverage them up so that when they come to a bank and ask for a line of credit, um, a $50,000, $100,000, $1 million line of credit to help grow their business, that their financials, they have their team in place, that everything is situated so when that, the time for growth comes, the business owner is ready, right? And it's it's... It's about readiness. It's about how do you come to the table with the right lawyer, the accountant, the right banker, right? Um, the, the right real estate person so that when it's time for your business to grow, when that big contract finally comes through, when you land that procurement relationship with the business, that you are ready to go. Um, so when I think about access to capital, it's not resources and information, it is mentorship. It is getting to the right people, having the right relationships, and um, really figuring out how to grow the business. So if we're interested in finding out more about these, this program you outlined, like how, how could we find out about it? You can visit wellsfargo.com, uh, put in small business resources. Uh, we have a site completely devoted to underserved communities, minority, black, brown community. Um, and really what we're doing is highlighting the small business stories, stories. How did this business owner win? What did they do to access capital? And providing additional um, connections. We also have a program called Connect to More, which is a mentorship program. Um, we put over 500 women in business through this Connect More. We're connecting them to women who are already CEOs of their organization for mentorship, and we're helping them through the the business of the business of growing your business. I love that. We have two last questions, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. So please start thinking about your questions. If you're thinking about starting a business, if there's something you want to advance in your own workplace, you currently have a business, please start thinking about it. We're going to open it up shortly. Dr. Peters, um, one of the biggest challenges that women have in business is successfully negotiating their worth. Can you share some tactics or some recommendations? So this is something I learned the hard way. Um, being in medicine, you want to be that martyr. You want to do the right thing. I want to treat my patients. And African-American women have been in STEM. We've been in medicine for a very long time. But talking money has always been shunned upon. And so what you have to know is, what are they paying your Caucasian male counterparts? What is the base for a Caucasian male? What is the maximum for a Caucasian male? And who are you? Is this a growth opportunity? Am I new to this industry? Or am I the best in the business? And I think this was a game changer for me is when they accidentally let me in the money room and I saw the numbers and saw that I was getting half of what the people I were, was hiring and training 
we're, we're getting. So I think you really need to know your value. And the other thing about knowing your value is if you see that these people, you can't, uh, I think as African American women, we always think we can outwork them. We can prove them wrong. We can outscore them. And that's been our strategy, but that is exhausting. The other thing about strategically knowing your worth is if you see that this is not some place that is going to promote you, this is not some place that is going to pay you, if this is not some place that you are going to thrive in, develop an exit strategy. That does not mean Amen. drop your mic and I quit. Develop an exit strategy. I've been here for 10 years. Where am I going to be a ten, um, for the next 10 years? Am I going to be an entrepreneur? Am I going to go into another place? At, at the other place, are there any African Americans in leadership? When I think about my mentorship, my mentorship has been African-American males and international mentors. I searched and searched just for mentorship and who were the people I remember. African-American males actually told me to go in the money room. I said, oh, I'm so happy here. I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm doing all these people's jobs. I love it. And they said, no, 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 no. Look at these numbers, girl. Like, you cannot, this is hurting my soul to see you live like this. So I think you really need to do your research. And the biggest power is going in. What are they paying an African American, uh, what are they paying Caucasian males going in? You have power when you're going in and develop an exit strategy. If they're not, if you're not gonna grow there, like Meghan Markle, I'm not gonna grow here. They are not for me. I can't outwork them, I can't outperform them. You gotta exit and bank on yourself. Alima, may I just add, it, it's a business transaction when you're in corporate or you're working for someone. Whether you're entrepreneurial while you're innovating, and if you're entrepreneurial, you're innovating inside of a company, three times your, your, your value. It's a business transaction. So you're not doing a favor for them and they're not doing a favor for you. You put in your time and you serve that organization and in return, they pay you. That's it. And stop, let's stop checking the list. Oh, I need to have all these 10 things plus the other five things. When our male counterparts and our white male counterparts is like, yeah, I got this one thing. <laughs> so that means I'm good. Or I've got, just got the in and I'm good. That's, uh, please it. take that to heart. Because again, this is, this is they're, they're telling their personal experience, this is statistically proven, right? A woman looks at a job description and looks and says, oh, I don't have, you know, 70%, I shouldn't apply. And a man looks at the title and is like, oh, I could, I could definitely do that. Oh, uh, uh, president of the United States? Oh, I'm good at that. Right, I mean, I like, like it. so I it's, it's it. very different. We've seen, we've seen that show, right? So it's, it's a real thing. And I, uh, Dr. Peters, I gotta say, Dr. Peters, I think, said a gospel, not just for business, right? When you go in, any relationship, at work or at home, you typically have maximum leverage and maximum power. Start as high as you can from day one, because you're gonna be negotiating from that base for the rest of your career and the rest of said relationship. Yes. Plan your exit strategy for everything. If we live 100 years, it will be a very short life. I know, I know I don't, I do not wanna be working 20 hours a day when I'm 67. No. Plan your exit strategy for your life so that you have time to love and celebrate and dance and have some yummy food and spot days and be on the beach so think about your life exit strategy right. and every step you take every hour you commit to something is it driving you towards that exit strategy for your total life yes. I'm gonna ask you Marika, the last question okay. which is before opening up to the audience which is that our our social capital as a community is extraordinary one little small example is if you think about the uh, the great nation of Jamaica and the impact the country of Jamaica has on the whole world. It's actually incredible, musically style. Because a lot of islands, frankly, none of us know of. I'm like, go around and name 100 islands in French Polynesia. No, we don't know them. But almost everybody in New Zealand, in Australia, in Shanghai, in Toronto, knows about this one. That's only one example. We could do this all day, from Baltimore to, to Harlem to Toronto, right? I'd love you to talk a little bit more about how we do a better job getting the financial rewards for the way our cultural capital changes the world. Oh, I love that question. Thank you. I know I got to close it out. Ooh, here we go. Okay, so our, our social capital, um, but it also plays into our relationships, how we treat people, and you opened with this, good human beings. And actually, 
you know, you also started with this, and I talked about your friends in the room who you've known literally since you were, what, seven and eight, you said, then 15 and et cetera. And so how we've been able to build as an organization uh, is through our relationships. So we are really proud to say we're six years old and we literally work with the biggest companies in the world. Uh, and I always tell people this, people are always watching you. And folks have literally been watching me since I was a kid, right? So you know this, they've been watching me since I was young. I got my very first opportunity, social capital, from a girl that I knew in middle school who then connected me with an opportunity after college, um, and that literally gave me my in. Uh, and then all of my clients to date for them, I don't market, I've never marketed my firm, but yet we have Amazon, we have Pinterest, we have Walgreens, we have Affleck, we have all of those brands, and I've never marketed one time. It has all been from relationships and what people know of me, right? So let's go back to the watching and what I am known for and what I bring. I've always been an executor. I've always been, when you come with ideas, we are going to get the job done, but we're not going to just get it done. We're going to get it done in excellence, right? And so that is the reputation, right? Uh, so you know with that Jamaica analogy, and I just got back last week, you know you're going to go and have an amazing time, and you're going to have some good food, you're going to have a nice turn up, you're going to have all these things. And so when people come to our organization, Coco B Productions, they know that they are going to get a hardworking team who delivers an excellence, because people have been watching me literally since the, since. I was in corporate America, right? Well, since middle school, clearly, in elementary school, then corporate America and what I delivered there. And then when I started my practice and how we deliver. And so I think how you show up and how you show up everywhere. So I show up the same way in social settings as I show up in professional settings because that matters. I love right? that. I love that. So listen, it's about delivering the right experience, yes. protecting your reputation, driving the culture forward in everything we do, and charging double. All right, let's open it up to the, uh, yes. let's open it up to the audience. I love um, ideas, please, sums it uh, up. We'd love to hear your questions and your comments. Raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you. If you have, a, we have a question over here on the left with a beautiful orange cardigan. If you have a question for a specific um, member, please, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Um, so my question is, um, how do you leverage your networking um, arena? Because for myself, I feel like we relate a lot. I'm Dr. Owens. I own a med spa in Town, Maryland, Baltimore County. And um, that's my cousin. Oh, no, What's the name of the spa? That's my, What's the name that's of my cousin. It's Body Basics Wellness Center. And it's like, it's giving me goosebumps because you guys are speaking to me. I actually just walked away from uh, my job with the federal government. Um, I maxed out my pay grade like years ago and they gave me a raise two years ago and then recently took it back and said, oh, it was an error. What? And it was a significant raise that they took right away. So prior to that, I've been planning my extra strategy a long time ago. So I've been building the, wet, the med spa and I actually had a grand opening last September. And so I was able on January 6th to say, hey, I'm resigning. And they're like, what do, what do you mean? What are you doing? So I kind of walked away from that job, that nine to five, and now I'm in business. And so I'm more out in the open and you know, getting into networking of how to leverage um, my networking um, partners to be able to grow and expand my business. No, I love that thing. If you couldn't hear, it's a beautiful example of walking away from a secure job at the federal government. I used to work for the Department of Defense, which again, it takes, it, it, I want to just reframe what risk means. A lot of us think it's very risky to leave your, not your job. But as I said earlier, right, your net worth is likely to be less if you don't own anything. So reevaluate what risk is. I think the core of the question for your, for your fly new med spa in Reisterstown is that how do you transform your net work to impact your net worth? Alima, would you mind answering that? Well, congratulations on your new med spa. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations on. Um, so people will maybe come to your med spa because, oh, I need a med spa. This is new. Let me. But they'll come back because of how you make them feel. Yeah. They're right? Sure They'll come you. back because of the relationship that you've, you've grown. Um, I saw um, everyone kind of greeting everyone. I said, you know, this is the power of relationships. 
call people, talk to them, see how they're doing, let them know what you're doing because relationships are built over time with transactions, not, hey, can you refer someone over to me, but I'm here for you, what do you need, how can we help? And then in turn, people, we naturally want to see you succeed and see you do well. Um, so the, the right network, the right relationships will help you grow your business. So meet some people in this room tonight, uh, today, talk to some people, call them, email them, invite them out to lunch, get to know them at a deep level, and I can guarantee that someone in this room will help you grow your business. I always live by this rule of 250. Each of us know at least 250 people, right? Um, so there is someone in this conference today that has the solution to what you're looking for, that has the capital that you need, that has the building that you're looking to buy, that has the relationship that's going to get you into a Wells Fargo to expand that procurement and really accelerate your business. So you have to look at it beyond the business transaction and think, how do I leverage my 250, but then how do I leverage another thousands 250? right? And then grow that network and expand. Absolutely. Dr. Peters, you had an addition? So one of the things is when you develop your exit strategy, you don't exit your relationships. Wow. So your consistent performance, relationship, and delivery on a premier experience, take those with you. You don't have to start from scratch as an entrepreneur. You don't have to start from scratch. And that was part of my negotiation going into it. I have these relationships. I have this brand of going the extra mile. I have this brand of working nonstop. And I took my relationships with me. When they lost me, they lost all of my relationships. So in your med spa from your previous things in the federal government, I mean, that's not a commercial entity, take some of your existing relationships, your existing brand, your consistent performance into your new um, venture. It do you don't have to start from scratch. Love that, love that. We have just a couple minutes, so uh, what's the next question? Thank you so much. Um, actually, I'm a graduate of uh, Walker's Legacy about two Ooh, years yeah. ago. Woo! Woo! Yeah. My consulting firm is doing excellent. Um, however, I'm now pivoting to my second business venture, which is in the FinTech. Um, and so now I'm in the process of pre-seed and I'm navigating this. And this is all new for me as far as having conversations with investors. So I'm curious, I've noticed people don't take me serious all the time. I look very young um, and I'm very new in this FinTech space and I'm a woman, a black woman at that. And so my question for any of the ladies is, from your experience, what strategies or how do you show up it's like, it doesn't matter what I know. It doesn't matter I have a PhD. They sometimes don't take me serious. So what do you all do to be taken serious, especially when we're talking about having conversations and investors and working in a predominantly male space? Thank you. Samantha? Is it? Yeah, so um, in the investment space, we're trying to, we're working really hard as an ecosystem to diversify what investment looks like, right? So I'm an investor. People would not think that because investors typically look like white older men. Um, so I would encourage you to find, uh, and we can have a separate conversation. First of all, don't sell yourself short. I had a girlfriend who was telling me on the vineyard last year, I'm struggling to find a million dollars. I course corrected that language. Now we're looking at a $50 million deal. Okay? So we just have to be unapologetically bold in stating exactly who we are, what we're offering, stand firm in that. Don't even bother repeating some of that stuff. Like, oh, they think I'm young. Oh, they don't want to take me seriously. They're going to take you seriously. You come in there with, you know what due diligence look like. Make sure you're, you're the, the uh, Dr. Peters talked about mentorship and championship. That is very, very important. So find mentors who are in this space, who can really look at your deck. Get into accelerators and, and, and more accelerators that are focused on uh, supporting you in your pre-seed and seed rounds and beyond. What's your A, B, C raises are gonna look like? You need to understand what your end goal looks like. What do you want your company to be evaluated at? That's your exit. Your exit is your valuation where you're exiting and selling to whomever. So list out and envision who you want to sell this fintech company in 5, 10, 15 years to. What that value needs to be. And if there's, you know, not if, 
when we start things as black people, it's always black and culture built in and designed into it. So make sure that black IP is protected and it's not undervalued. So just stand firm, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Also consider um, black funds. So if you're not, make sure you look at uh, Rich Lou Dennis's new ventures. Make sure you look at the Fearless Fund. Melody Hospin has a new fund that is focused on black entrepreneurs. BlackRock has capital focused on black entrepreneurs. SoftBank has capital focused on black entrepreneurs. But your number one place you gotta go is Wells Fargo, to be clear. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but just also, sometimes we gotta fund ourselves, right? So let me think through how that is. Let's take the last question. Hi, my name is Kendra Nelson, and I have a small uh, media and marketing firm. Uh, my question is really for my daughter. She's 12 years old, and so we're looking forward 10 years from now when she may be in the career, um, into her career, or maybe even looking at college. I've told her already that she doesn't have to go to college, but if she does, it has to be HBCU. Um, but my question is for, uh, for people who are entering in the workforce, what do you look for in terms of talent? How do you identify talent as an employer uh, at your company if they don't go the traditional routes? Marika, I'll take it. Sure. So first off, not traditional route. Kennedy, raise your hand. She did not come to me the traditional route. Um, we actually had posts online. We were looking for folks, indeed, all the things. Uh, and she DM'd me, and I was like, "Wait, who is this?" Look, <laughs> she was like, "I've applied for your company, and you didn't. And they didn't say nothing yet. And I want that job. And I said, hire her, okay? And she with me today, right? Uh, and I told the team, I said, "Look at this." Um, and so, and I've never gone the traditional route. So my experience is I, I didn't have the pedigree, right? Like, and, and that means I didn't go to Ivy League. I didn't work on a presidential campaign. I didn't, you know, intern in Congress, you know, as a young person. I was no page. Like my parents, that, that wasn't my story, right? So I rose in the building confident. And I think it's important, you know, and I, and I was like one of those white guys because I always believe I can do it. Like, I can do it, right? Didn't have the experience. It wasn't on paper. They told me, I'm going to give you this job you never had, you didn't even know existed. And I said, and I can do it. And I believe in me, right? And so I wrote a book called The Blueprint to Manifest Your Dreams. So if I see it and I believe it and I pursue it and I work hard enough, I'm going to get it. So th that's my principles. That's what I believe. And so um, I think that with, you know, one of the things you need to come to the table is hard work, right? Being able to research. So yes, it might not be a part of now, you know, if you want to be a doctor and things, that's totally different. Like it's certain certifications you got to have, baby, and things. But, you know, um, there are certain things you can do to be able to get it done, right? And so I think I never go in, if it's something that is of interest to me and I believe that it is for me and I can do it, I am going to do the necessary work and research to get it done. But there are ways not to come through traditional methods it, uh, and you may not even have the pedigree, but if you have, and I asked my mentor one time, I said, how did you even hire me? And I know they told you not to, because I didn't have a pedigree on paper. And when I walked in the building, it was that energy. So talking about that energy, being a good human being, being someone that someone connects with and trust, um, because a lot of times, uh, some of my executive clients, they need to make sure that they can trust me, right? And while it might not be on my resume that I can get it done, they know I will figure it out or hire it out to the necessary person to be able to get it done. But they trust me in that. And I bring that energy in the room that um, I think that good human being energy, which is important. No, I, lo I love that. So um, I'm gonna wrap us up with two things. So one is, while we're talking about jobs, I'm gonna selfishly plug um, that I am hiring at Lobo 1707 Tequila. So please give us a Google. We're hiring all around the country. We have another entity called Pronghorn, one of the other executives, Tony Fletcher's in the room here, where we are investing in 57 black-owned spirits brands, everything from scratch and existing. Love it. Right, so we, we, are, we are deploying capital if you are interested in that industry. And we are driving 1,800 new black employees in the whole spirits industry, Bacardi, Moe Hennessy, Diageo, all of these in, over the next 10 years. So pronghorn.co, please check it out. We are looking for incredible talent all around the country. I want to say thank you again to our incredible sponsor, Wells Fargo. I cannot overstate 
Um, it, it, you can have the best idea. I grew up in New York City. I would see talented people as Beyonce on the subway because they had no capital, right, to be to go to the next level. Please take the time, check out this opportunity with Wells Fargo, get yourself capitalized to build your trajectory to the dream we painted to lay on the beach, right? When you turn 67. I'm so thankful for all of your time. Thank you again to all the work that Sanjay's team does. Thank you, Zach McDaniels and the, uh, McDaniels and the full CIAA team. Thank you so much to these beautiful, incredibly kind, but boss, intelligent, just badass women on the stage, but also I see reflected in the audience. Please enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.